The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. What a year to take over as leader of a political party, decimated in the last election and looking to rebuild in the middle of a global pandemic. That describes Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca, and we'll hear from him tonight. Then, does Ontario still need elected school boards, or should we do what some other provinces are doing and get rid of them? We'll debate that tonight. It's Monday, April 26th, and that's ahead on the agenda. A little over a year ago, Stephen Del Duca won the Ontario Liberal leadership on the first ballot at what was nicknamed the Corona Convention because COVID-19 had just struck. In that year, Del Duca has had to retire the Liberals' multi-million dollar debt, find more new candidates than any previous Liberal leader ever, come up with some policy ideas that might get the Liberals to rebound from their worst showing in history in the last election, and do it all online from his dining room table as we've been under stay-at-home orders. How's all that going? Well, let's find out. Here's Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca, who joins us now from Vaughan, Ontario. And it's good to have you on TVO again. How are you managing today? Well, it's great to be on with you. I appreciate the opportunity and I'm doing okay today. Good. As we suggested in the intro, Mr. Del Duca, you've had, I don't know what else to call it, other than the worst to-do list of any Liberal leader in history, uh, an enormous job bringing your party back from the worst showing it's ever had in history. Do you ever have days where you wonder, why did I want this job in the first place? <laughs> no, listen, it's, uh, it's uh, as you know, I've been involved in government and politics for a good chunk of my life. And uh, having the chance to, uh, to win the Ontario Liberal Party leadership has been the honor of my lifetime. Uh, there is a lot of work to do. Uh, let's be really clear about that. We've gotten a lot accomplished over the last year, but we still have a lot to do. And uh, it, look, it's been a struggle this year for everybody across Ontario. I'm not excluded from that list, but uh, I love this work. I love my province and I want us to do better. Now, because you don't have 12 seats at Queen's Park, you're not what's called an officially constituted party, which means you miss out on literally millions of dollars of funding that could go towards hiring more staff, doing more research, et cetera, et cetera. How much do you think that has handicapped your efforts over the past year? Well, there have been moments when it's really been noticeable, especially around things like research and having a certain, you know, certain number of questions in the legislature uh, earlier on in particular. But I, I got to tell you, Steve, between our caucus and the staff that we do have and the thousands of volunteers that comprise our party in every corner of Ontario, I think we've done remarkably well. We've been really, really resilient. We've transitioned to this new reality and we're making some very noticeable progress. But Again, we have a lot of work still to do. There's no doubt about that. This is not meant to be a question to trip you up, but I do hear it out there, so that's why I want to put it to you. How important do you think personal charisma is to a leader's ability to lead? You know, I think it's one of the ingredients that people do want to see in their in their leaders. There's there's no doubt about that, but I think the far more important, I guess, currency, if I can put it that way, especially in the moment that we see right now in the province of Ontario is competence. I think the people of Ontario want to know that the next premier, the next leader, the next individual that they are going to have to work with in order to um, really create an incredible future for everybody who calls this province home is somebody who understands the job that needs to be done and someone who accepts the real responsibility of being premier and being leader. And I believe I have that in spades. Uh, you know, Doug Ford, for all of his faults, I have heard people say that he has a particular kind of charisma that does connect uh, with people, particularly people who uh, are on the populist side of politics. Would you grant that you don't have that? Uh, look, I, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm the last person that should be judging whether or not, you know, I have uh, what, what brand of charisma I may or may not have. Uh, you know, you might have you might have remembered at the leadership convention in March of last year in my convention speech, I I talked about the grade three speech that I gave in front of my entire school. And the subject of that speech was responsibility. And I actually won the speech contest. So you might recall, Steve, the line I used at the convention was, as you can see, 
I've been working on my charisma for a very long time. I got a few laughs in the auditorium, but again, when I think about all the issues that matter most to me as a dad, as a husband, uh, as a son, as a brother, so I'm talking about publicly funded education, universal public health care, the fight against the climate crisis, economic dignity, and so much more, I want a leader, and I believe this province wants a leader who knows how to get the job done. And I don't think we have that right now, and I believe I bring those skills to the table. When you won your party's leadership a little over a year ago, you did make some promises to party members and therefore to Ontarians as a whole as to how you would conduct yourself as leader. And one of the things that you promised to do, for example, was to have 30 candidates in the next election, which is in June 2022, who would be under the age of 30. How well are you doing at fulfilling that? So we have five candidates under the age of 30 uh, out of the 34 that we've nominated so far. Some of the other commitments that I made was that uh, 50% of our candidates would be female. As of today, we're at, I think, 62%. Uh, obviously, we want to see a team of candidates. I'm determined uh, to feel the team of candidates that reflect all of Ontario. Uh, more than 50% of our candidates are people of color. So we're making some really incredible progress there, but we still have a lot of additional work to do there as well. Sounds like you're not going to make the 30 under 30, though. Is that right? You know, I, you know, I'm still optimistic. We have a really vibrant uh, wing in our party known as the Ontario Young, Young Liberals. They're working hard with our candidate search team. I think five out of 34 is pretty good so far. There are lots of other women and men still uh, who are under the age of 30 or about 30 who are planning to come forward from what I understand. So I'm strongly urging every single Ontarian who shares my passion for progress, my impatience for progress, and wants to put their name on a ballot, you know, reach out to us, reach out to me directly, uh, and let's see if you can't win a nomination uh, to get on uh, to help get our province back on track. Does your party give you the power to appoint candidates to a nomination? Yes, our constitution gives the leader of the party up to five appointments. I've used two of those five so far. Uh, one candidate, Jill Permoli in Mississauga, another candidate, uh, Marilyn Raphael in Brampton. Uh, so there are three more uh, appointments that are potentially available to me, but there are lots of really great contested nominations we've had everywhere. And the really cool thing for me, Steve, is that there's a, a very strong energy level within our team of candidates so far. They're working so hard already. It makes me, uh, I'm greatly encouraged by the progress we're making there too. Well, the reason I asked the question is that, and you know, you and I have both been around politics long enough to know that there is a fine balance between respecting local democracy and allowing people in their ridings to, to buy memberships and appoint who they, or rather vote for who they want to become the candidate. But the leader also obviously wants to have a few of his or her choices along the way as well. And from time to time, they will put their thumb on the scale for a particular candidate. Uh, I raise this because we're hearing rumblings in two Toronto ridings, uh, Toronto Centre and St. Paul's, that your office is in effect uh, putting their thumb on the scale for your preferred choices, potentially over local choices that happen to be racialized candidates and, and you know, may have some currency in the ridings. Could you comment on that, please? As you said off the top there, uh, I've been around this uh, system uh, within my own party for quite some time. I know there are people who go through the nomination process uh, for whom it can be tough when the outcome that they're hoping for isn't the one that actually occurs. Now, what I know is that our candidate search team, uh, the individuals who work as volunteers, by the way, our candidate search process is chaired by three strong liberal women who are doing a great job. Uh, I know that we've been we've been talking to thousands of people across this province who want to run for the party. I'm delighted with the strength of the candidates that we have so far, and I look forward. We haven't called the nomination in Toronto St. Paul's just as of yet, but I know that there's already some really exciting interest there, and I'm looking forward to working alongside whoever we ultimately nominate in that really great liberal riding or that really great Toronto riding, I should say. Hmm. Right. Can't call it a liberal writing today. It's in a democratic yet. writing today. Not yet. That is right. Uh, okay. Can you confirm, I, I know there's been a bit of batting back and forth on this one, but can you confirm that you will be running in Vaughan in the next election? Yeah, absolutely. That is the plan. That's what I, that's the premise or the basis upon which I'm operating. And uh, I really look forward to being the candidate here in Vaughan Warbridge, my home riding where I'm sitting right now today. Uh, and I, I'm so delighted about the progress we made here locally. Uh, Vaughan opened its hospital a, a little bit earlier during the pandemic. That's thanks to the investment of Ontario Liberals. Uh, the Highway 427 extension is about to open, I suspect. Again, an investment from Ontario Liberals. There's a lot of exciting thing ha things happening here. So yes, I'm looking forward uh, to being the candidate next year in this, in this riding.
Uh, the question comes up because, of course, there's a lot of speculation that Michael Cotto may go federal. That would open up Don Valley East. That is a very safe liberal seat. Might you contest that if there were a by-election there first? Yeah, look, we're not. I'm not looking at that right now. You, you know, you talk about uh, Michael Cotto, my dear friend, my colleague, someone who I've known for many, many years. Uh, obviously, and I told Michael this. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't want him to leave. I don't want him to leave. But I also, as a friend, support his desire to continue his public service. Uh, I'm excited about what he has to offer the people of Don Valley East at the federal level. Uh, and so obviously I want to see him do well. And whatever decision needs to be made at whatever point in time the nomination takes place in Don Valley East, we'll, we'll take a serious look at every option at that point in time. But if Michael wins that nomination, and I know how hard he's working, he'll make a phenomenal MP. All right. Let me take you now from your internal dealings uh, with the Liberal Party of Ontario to more of the events of the day. And I'm going to take you back to two Fridays ago when, in the midst of this third wave, uh, Premier Ford held a, uh, well, I guess what's turned out to be a pretty extraordinary news conference in which he made several announcements about fighting COVID-19, including shutting down park spaces, including uh, equipping the police with a lot more power to stop people, powers it turned out they didn't want, and in fact, uh, almost, uh, almost universally uh, refused. Uh, the public blowback was immediate, and the Premier stood down on some of that, not all of that, but some of that. My question for you is, if you had been the Premier of Ontario two Fridays ago, tell me what the announcement you would have made. Well, I think certainly the point that we found ourselves two Fridays ago in particular, but I believe if I'd been Premier prior to that, my message to the people of Ontario would have been crystal clear. I'm going to follow the science and I'm going to listen to the scientists. Uh, there are women and men who serve on the Premier's own science advisory table who have unimpeachable characteristics, integrity, knowledge. They are the women and men who should be leading the fight against COVID-19, which, after all, is a public health crisis. And the fact that Doug Ford ignored consistently the advice that they've been giving uh, and to, to end up in a place where this third wave is brutal, uh, where people continue to get sick and tragically die, is just... It, it, it's the clearest abdication of leadership I've seen in Ontario's history by a premier. You know, Steve, that I've said Doug Ford is clearly in over his head. Uh, I don't believe that he's got what it takes to get us through this ordeal. And I think he's got to go. I've asked him to resign. I stand by that call. Uh, but if he's not going to get out of the way, if he's not going to resign now, then we will work as hard as we possibly can to defeat him in the next election to get Ontario back on track. You know, I, I have been following this stuff for almost four decades, and I can't ever recall a Premier of Ontario taking his advice on when to stay or when to go from the leader of the third party, which has eight seats and his isn't one of them. So if I were Doug Ford, why would I listen to you on that? Well, I think there's something far more profound, as much as I respect the last four decades of Ontario political history. There's something so much more profoundly important at this moment. This is not... This is not like any other political issue that we kind of talk about, the cut and thrust of politics on a day-to-day -day basis. This is an ordeal that we have not had to experience well in decades, I mean, perhaps ever, and people are losing their lives at this moment. The stories are tragic and the inaction and the inability or the disinterest from Doug Ford to actually do what needs to be done, to listen to the scientists and get us through this ordeal is just shocking. So he, he's got to go like he doesn't he doesn't. This is not Stephen Del Duca, by the way, alone calling for this. It's become painfully evident to the people of Ontario uh, who've lost their trust and their confidence in this premier. So I want him to get out of the way because I want us to get through COVID-19. I want paid sick leave. I want smaller class sizes. I want a real plan to deal with long term care. The list goes on from there. Doug Ford is the clearest impediment to Ontario's progress at this moment that I've ever seen. And that's why I believe he's got to go. Uh, understood, but if he were to leave, that means somebody from his cabinet would presumably take over. And I infer from that that you think somebody else in that cabinet could do a better job. Is that right? Well, it's interesting. The day before he made the announcement around police and parks being shut down, uh, that disastrous day when he was met with a true wave of fury from every corner of this province and deservedly so the day before that i called on doug ford to get out of the way not to resign as premier in that moment but to get out of the way and appoint a COVID czar and to give to vest the authority in an individual and i recommended dr stanley brown or dr david naylor there are others 
who could be picked from his own science table to navigate the rest of this COVID-19 pandemic. You think about this for a quick second. The science advisory table has been giving him advice for weeks, for months, and the advice comes to Doug Ford. He then takes it into a confidential cabinet meeting that by his own admission, Steve goes on for nine hours. You know, in one example, I've served in two senior portfolios inside cabinet. I can't understand how you need nine hours to listen to the advice. That's not a cabinet meeting, that is dysfunction. And dysfunction in the midst of a public health crisis has been deadly for far too many Ontarians. So I recommended he get out of the way. He appoint a COVID czar, that individual will have the authority to get through the rest of this crisis and we rebuild on the other side. He then made his announcement on Friday that we've talked about already. And that's when I was forced in many respects to say, he's made it clear. He does not have the capacity to lead this province. He's got to get out of the way. He's got to go. Again, if he won't do it of his own accord because he realizes it's the right thing to do, then we're going to get rid of him next year in the election campaign. And I believe that's what the people of Ontario will want to see. I appreciate your position that you say the science has to rule the day, but what happens when, and this has happened on occasion, what happens when uh, honorable scientific people with good solid backgrounds give you conflicting advice? Does the premier at that point not have to bring his own best judgment to bear? I don't know that I've heard of any conflicting advice on things like paid sick leave. Now, I asked Doug Ford 410 days ago in a letter dated from March 12th of last year, of 2020, to reinstate paid sick leave. He and his, his government have now voted against various opposition motions and bills on paid sick leave around 20 times in the legislature. And think about this for a quick second. We heard, what, four days ago, five days ago from Doug Ford that he had suddenly seen the light, that he was going to introduce paid sick leave, which we know hundreds of thousands of essential workers in places like Peel and beyond across this province so desperately need. And here we are four or five days later, Steve, and we've heard nothing. We've heard nothing. I, I don't get that. I don't understand how it's possible when you belatedly acknowledge you got to do it and you control a majority government that you go to sleep, that you seemingly take the weekend off while people are still getting sick. This is exactly what I'm talking about when I explain he doesn't have the capacity to lead this province. It's why he needs to go. Well, okay, on the issue of paid sick days, uh, I think you're right. I don't think there's much debate left in the province about whether or not to bring that program in. But let's look at something else. For example, in Peel region, you've got the Medical Officer of Health there using Section 22 of the Health Protection Act to shut down businesses, while at the same time in York region, the region where you are right now, I mean, we had the medical officer of health on this program two weeks ago, and he was saying, I'm taking a contrary position. I'm not urging businesses to be shut down. In fact, I'm trying to keep them open. Now, those are two intelligent scientific voices they offering are. conflicting advice. If you're the premier, what do you do in that case? But I don't, but I don't look at that as conflicting advice. They, they have the power under Section 22, as you talked about, to do what they are choosing to do, given the nature of how they're fighting the virus in each of their respective regions. And so Dr. Lowe and Dr. Kurji and Dr. Davila and the other medical doctors that we have in leadership positions across the province have that option to make those decisions locally. But I bet if you asked each one of them, do you support paid sick leave like the science advisory table has asked for? Well, it would be unanimous. In fact, the only person in Ontario who seems to not really be interested or willing to deliver on paid sick leave is Doug Ford. And that's, again, a very clear indication that he's in over his head, that he doesn't have the capacity or the interest or the desire. And I don't really understand why that is, Steve. Like, I, There are days when I think he just doesn't trust workers enough uh, to, to, to use a program that could help keep them safe and could help keep them alive in some cases. And that's a really stunning indictment of someone who's supposed to leave this entire province. Well, let me ask you a blunt follow-up question, which is you were once Minister of Transportation, Minister of Economic Development. You don't have a health policy background. How do you know you'd be any better? Well, that's why I said I'd follow the science. You know, there's something that's really important in leadership now more so than ever before, and that's self-awareness. Doug Ford doesn't have it. Now I know I'm not perfect, and those closest to me, my family and friends, will be the first to tell you I'm a work in progress, and I have a lot of room to improve. But I will know, or I will say, that at this point in my life, especially after what I went through in 2018, I'm self-aware enough to know when I need help and when I'm prepared to ask for help. And in this case, because I don't have a science background, 
which Doug Ford doesn't either, I would want the scientists to give me the advice. If I was going, look, if we were, and this is the example I used the other day. If we were in a military campaign, I also don't have a military background. Wouldn't I want a commander in chief, a, a, and I called it a COVID czar, as I said er earlier, wouldn't I want my own version of Eisenhower to lead the liberation of Europe? That's the example that I've used in the past. I stand by that example. Of course you would. Of course you would. You wouldn't want the politicians to get into the way or, or to meddle. And frankly, we don't know who's lobbying Doug Ford. We don't know who's whispering in his ear. What we do know is that 410 days after I first asked for paid sick leave to be reinstated, five days after he told us that he was going to do it, we still haven't seen it. So there is something fundamentally broken and dysfunctional inside that premier's office, inside the current conservative government. People are getting sick. This is life and death. It's tragic. We need to listen to the scientists. And if I was premier today, it's what I would be doing because I'm self-aware enough to know when I need help. Doug Ford, well, he, he's needed help for weeks. Now it's too late. He's got to get out of the way. He's got to go. Just curious, have you in your time as Ontario Liberal leader had any either face-to-face -face or Zoom meetings with the Premier? Uh, he invited uh, the opposition leaders to one face-to-face -face meeting that I was able to attend. This was several months ago, nothing on Zoom. But I will, I will say during the first wave in particular of the pandemic, I did have, I believe it was three telephone conversations with the Premier uh, at that point in time. But that would have been no, uh, probably at the, you know, the last point would have been I want to say six, seven, eight months ago at the very least. Was it a useful conversation? You know, I've, I've long said, or I've said throughout the pandemic that I think the other mistake that Doug Ford has made amongst many has been not inviting the opposition leaders in, all of us on a regular basis to have a collaborative conversation about finding a way through some of the specific challenges that Ontario faces. Again, I know that I don't know everything, but I did serve for four years in cabinet. I'm, I'm leading a party that has a caucus that includes a former premier, former cabinet ministers. We want to be helpful. We want to collaborate. Now, I have not found that on a consistent basis that Doug Ford's been willing to have that kind of conversation with all of us. Again, if I was premier today, it's what I would be doing. We see lots of historical examples of leaders who want the best advice coming from every corner during a crisis when partisanship, partisanship shouldn't matter. Okay, we're down to our last minute here, and I will grant you that I am a bit of a slave to history, so this may be a ridiculous question, but I'm going to put it to you anyway. Uh, the province of Ontario is 154 years old, and in all of that time, only three governments in Ontario history have failed to be re-elected. The very first one in 1867, Bob Ray's government in 1990, and then there was the United Farmers of Ontario in 1923. In other words, when you win once, the public tends to give you a second kick at it. I wonder how daunting you find that historical precedent to what you're trying to achieve. Well, listen, I'm, I'm also a student of history, as you probably can tell from, from this interview today and from conversations we've had in the past, and I respect history. Uh, but it's not, to me, it's not about the historical examples. And the reason I don't feel that it's terribly daunting is because this isn't about me. And this isn't even about Ontario liberals as individuals. This is about all of us. This is about 15 million people who call this province home. They want a publicly funded education system that's second to none. They want a real plan to confront the climate crisis. They want good jobs for their kids and grandkids so they can afford a home, so they can afford to move forward in life. You know, all of that universal public health care, the list goes on and on and on from there. We are going through something truly unprecedented right now in Ontario. And I believe coming out of this, there will be a desire, a strong desire for security, resiliency, empathy, and a new normal that actually harnesses all of our capacity in this province to do incredible things. That's Stephen Del Duca, leader of the Ontario Liberals. Mr. Del Duca, we're grateful you spared some time for us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you and stay safe and healthy. They're the oldest form of democracy in Canadian history. In fact, they predate Canada itself. But some provinces have eliminated school boards altogether. Manitoba is trying to do that right now, in fact, prompting the question of whether we should do likewise in Ontario. Let's debate that tonight. Joining us now in Kingston, Ontario, Lori French. She is a trustee for the Limestone District School Board representing Greater Napanee. She's also president of the Canadian School Boards Association. In Georgetown, Ontario, 
John Snowblin, former progressive conservative minister of education, now a strategy consultant with MK and A, and in Pickering, Ontario, Sachin Maharaj, lecturer in educational leadership and policy at OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. And it's great to have you three with us on the agenda tonight in our kind of uh, newfangled setup now that we've all been sent home. Um, we really appreciate you folks sparing some time for us tonight. Laurie, get us started here. Just tell us, in essence, what's the job of an Ontario school trustee? Well, democratic representation is a core value in Canada and school boards are a part of that. And trustees, as you noted, uh, have been in place since uh, before the country was established and other forms of government to ensure that local communities uh, are providing for the education of children. And so that continues. And while we've evolved over the, the, the decades since then, of course, as, as we should, and the systems modernized, uh, the role of the trustee has not diminished uh, and the need for that local voice uh, and local contact is critical. School board trustees really are the eyes and the ears of the community, I would say, and most of the tasks um, and, and responsibilities as outlined in legislation that are quite unique to the role of trustee, uh, focus on um, accountability, focus on setting the budget, setting local policy, uh, ensuring that the multi-year strategic plans are producing the results. We employ the director of education and, and really just um, connect with um, the, the, the community and our constituents. And, and now presently in Ontario, we are um, the, the uh, bargaining agent on behalf of uh, school boards through the provincial association for thousands of educational staff and, and administrators. So okay, it's, that sounds it's, uh, like a it's very sounds like an exhaustive list of responsibilities. How many hours a week? Give me a ballpark. Do you think you work? Uh, well, my role is a little bit different at the national level and formerly at the provincial level, but um, I, I would say this is uh, 20 to 30 hours a week, uh, at least, uh, in, in serving the constituents and, and serving on those different uh, board tables. And how much do you get paid for that? Well, trustees uh, in Ontario are paid anywhere from around $5,000 uh, a year to maybe $25,000 plus in larger boards. It's based on enrollment, which is unique to any other elected role. Uh, and that is a stipend. That is not a salary uh, with benefits. Um, and, and so you can see that uh, this, is, this is not a, a lucrative role. This is because we are dedicated. This is community service and we care about our schools. Okay, John Snowblin, come on in here and tell us how you would describe the value of school board trustees to the education system today? Well, we've got a lot of really good trustees out around uh, the province. I've met a lot of them. Um, but I can tell you that in, in my experience, uh, form should follow function. The function of school boards has changed dramatically over the last 25 years, over the last 50 years. And uh, we haven't seen any change in the form. So I really think that we need to have another look at how we govern education, how we deliver education, and how we can put the voice of local parents into the system in a better way than the school board trustee system as it currently exists. Let's do a little walk down memory lane here because of course you were the Minister of Education when the Mike Harris government was in power and uh, you, did a, you broke a lot of eggs, let's put it that way. You wanted to change things quite significantly, uh, cut the number of school board trustees, uh, slash the pay to what it is now, much smaller than it was before, take away their taxing powers in many cases. Uh, the, the school board folks didn't like any of that very much. Why did you feel a need to do it? Well, let's look at the taxing powers. You know, uh, we had a very, uh, a very quiet, sensible mayor in Mississauga, uh, near where I live. Uh, at the time, she told me that trustees could set a budget, but they didn't have to go to get the money from the people, you know, and, and it seemed wrong to her and to me too that you have a level of government uh, spending money but not having to collect it. So we thought it was the smart thing to do to have the province pay for an essential service like education so that local community standards or local community uh, wealth didn't have much to do with the quality of the school or quality of education. So school boards no longer have to, school board trustees no longer have to set those kinds of uh, global budgets. The government obviously needed to take over the central negotiating table with, uh, you know, where we spend 80% of our budget on teachers and, and uh, teacher supports. Uh, so there were dramatic changes in how that happened. We also had one entity, the province, doing curriculum instead of 170 odd 
uh, curriculum boards across the province. I think those are all obvious things. They all make a lot of sense. Uh, and we did those back in 95, 96, 97. Mm -hmm. Sachin Maharsh, let me bring you in here to ask a bit of an overarching question, which is if the provincial government has a particular vision for how they would like to reform uh, education in the province of Ontario, as John Snowblin's government did uh, 25 plus years ago, how helpful or not can trustees be in that effort? Well, as Laurie mentioned, I mean, trustees come from the local communities that they serve. And so in a province as large as on Ontario with, you know, close to 5,000 schools and huge geographic differences, although you might have, you know, curriculum and, and other education policy emanating from Queen's Park in Toronto, how to effectively implement that across the province is going to look different. And I think having elected school board trustees from those communities can help sort of tailor um, the education policy to the different needs across the province. And so without that local voice and representation, um, I think you're going to run into some issues about how schools should effectively serve communities across Ontario. Let, let me do a, uh, let's do a simple voice vote here. Uh, Laurie, on the issue of whether we should get rid of trustees across the province of Ontario, you vote how? Uh, definitely, we would need to keep school board trustees, absolutely. John Snowblin, if you were put to a vote in the legislature today, yay or nay on school board trustees, how would you vote? Nay, I think we need to reorganize this. I think we need to get closer to parents, not further away from them. Sachin, you get to break the tie. How would you vote? I would not vote to uh, get rid of elected school board trustees. And I think if you look in other provinces that have done that recently, whether it's New Brunswick or PEI, there have kind of been moves to sort of bring them back in some, some form. So I, I don't think that would be a good idea. Well, let's find out uh, what Conrad Yakubuski of the Globe and Mail thinks about this, because um, a few years ago, he wrote a column about this in which he was not at all on the fence. Let's bring up this quote here. The truth is, he wrote, that most school boards offer a sorry spectacle of Canadian democracy in action. They cannot even govern themselves, much less look out for students in their charge. They are plagued by petty ideological battles, personality conflicts, incivility, and sheer incompetence. You need adult supervision. The number of cases of provincial education ministers being forced to intervene directly in the management of dysfunctional school boards, even firing entire slates of trustees, keeps growing. From Halifax to Vancouver, this pathetic pattern keeps repeating itself, yet provincial governments never seem to learn the lessons of these fiascos. All right, we've got to get some response to this. Laurie, obviously, um, you know, he's not wrong about some of what he says there. There have been numerous instances where school boards have shown themselves completely dysfunctional and the province needs to come in and take a look at things. Uh, can, you, can you categorically say he's wrong about what he's written? Well, uh, Steve, unfortunately, there are, there are bad examples of, of governors at all levels of government. That's not a, a reason to eliminate a representative voice in, in any way. Um, with respect to school board trustees in particular, uh, that, that is the work of, of school boards to continue to develop and evolve and, and represent their communities. Uh, but, but acting with integrity is something that we do. And proportionately speaking, uh, this is not the, the majority of school boards. Uh, I, I would say that you know, those examples are examples that, that absolutely uh, need to be addressed, uh, but are not a reason to eliminate democracy. John Snowblin, do you think he's taking the exception and making it the rule? And in, in that case, it's not really a fair point to make? Well, school boards are different across the province. Uh, you know, you see rural school boards work a little differently than urban ones do. And, and some of them seem perpetually in disorder at best, you know, to be polite about it. Uh, but that's not all of them. The real problem here, I think, is that we need innovation in education. There are some significant things we could do to improve the educational materials that are available in a classroom, the delivery of, of, of uh, curriculum. And school boards, in my experience, are never the folks who do innovation. Uh, they actually kind of act as a sort of a governor on innovation in the system. And that's one of the reasons why I think uh, they've kind of outgrown their usefulness. Sachin, is that a fair comment? Well, I think when we have criticisms of school boards, we need to make a distinction here. So there's school boards in the sense of the administrative units that, you know, hire the teachers and, and run the schools. And then there's the elected 
school board board of trustees that oversees um, all of that. And I think when we talk about dysfunctional school boards or examples of that, you know, in many uh, of those instances that had to do with, you know, the administration, whether it was directors of education and so on. And that's kind of a separate issue from the boards of elected trustees. And I think one of the, the criticisms that we've seen in recent years is we, we've had examples of some dysfunction, particularly, say, in the Toronto board or some of the GTA school boards. And because that's where a lot of our media is based, that's used to often generalize to, to school boards across the entire province where that may not necessarily be the case. So I don't think it's a fair criticism to say, you know, school boards across Ontario are somehow dysfunctional. No, fair enough. But Laurie, you know, uh, I well remember the story at the Toronto District School Board for a while. They had to bring in an outsider to do an independent study. I mean, it was a bloody soap opera there. How damaging are instances like that to perhaps the broader cause which you would like to promote? Well, those are examples where, um, you know, work needs to be done and, and we need to strengthen the governance role in, in that situation. Uh, you know, we, we, can't, uh, we can't dispute that those situations didn't exist. The point is that we, we, that is the opportunity to continue to advance. You know, to the points that were made earlier about innovation, school boards enable that to happen by responding to local communities and, and the uniquenesses. Um, one size does not fit all from a, from a curriculum or a governance uh, perspective and and really to be able to understand what's happening in individual communities that's where we can tailor it and find those moments of innovation allowing our teachers to fly and to 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 bring that to the classroom that's where innovation happens and creating the conditions for that is what school boards do through funding through budgets strategic planning and setting policy and and that is our role uh, and and to diminish that or minimize that or centralize it has great risk for communities well, all right, let me come at this a different way. And John Snowblin, I'll, I'll get you first on this one. Uh, we vote for our school board trustees during municipal elections. So it's basically every four years. And, uh, you know, we have empirically provable facts to look at that show that many, many people who go to the polls don't bother to tick the box for school board trustee. Many school board trustees, in addition, also run uncontested. I think it's also fair to say many, many electors don't even know who their school board trustee is. In your view, should that make us question the legitimacy of the democratic legitimacy of school boards? Well, it's, John, it's that's you, you. I mean, most yeah, most people couldn't pick uh, their their school board trustee out of a police lineup. Um, you know, that's just the way it is. If you want to talk about accountability, you know, uh, if you had the local directors of education reporting to a deputy minister, reporting to a minister responsible to the legislature, there's a lot of media attention. There's uh, the kind of structure for accountability that works. That's not present in our current school board system. Sachin, do we have a bit of a democratic deficit when it comes to school board trustees? I mean, maybe, but I think a similar point could be made with municipal politics more generally, like how many people know their local city councillor or regional councillor or whatever it is. And in many of those cases, um, turnout is low and, and people are sort of reelected. I mean, look at in the Toronto City Council, city councillors are reelected, you know, perpetually. And so I think you see some of the same issues. I think part of that has to do with the nature of school school boards themselves part of that has to do with the lack of political parties at the muni municipal level you know in places like bc where there are political parties um, school board members kind of can run on a, on a slate and there can be a platform and there can be more awareness um, in that regard so yeah i mean there there is a some of an issue there but i don't think there's reason to get rid of elected school board trustees on that basis any more than there would be to get rid of you know, local city councillors. Okay, but Laurie, do you think that uh, school board trustees have a, a democratic legitimacy problem given how few people vote for them or apparently are interested in what they do? 
Uh, well, I wouldn't say they're not interested in what we do. Um, I can tell you when there's a concern or a question uh, that would never be answered directly from a minister's office, um, they find their local trustees. So whether they know them actively on a day-to-day -day basis is a very different thing. And not exercising your right to vote is no reason to remove the right to vote for that representative. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that we have to remember uh, is that school boards uh, in, in uh, recent uh, research have actually uh, been proven to be much more diverse than uh, than most levels of government. And, and that's a critical thing in, in the current environment. So uh, more than half are women uh, and many more are proportionately uh, black, indigenous or people of color. And uh, this, this really is something that we need to think about um, across all democratic levels. Uh, and, and so I, I think that um, that strengthens the role and, and the ability to be present in the community uh, and know our communities very much uh, to be able to serve them. Well, having said that, John, many provinces, including Quebec and Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and now Manitoba, which is in the midst of this, they've got a bill before the legislature right now to, to try to eliminate school boards. Uh, they are doing it. They either have done it or are in the process of doing it. Uh, what do you think that says about school boards across the country? I think Ontario is 20 years late on this. I think we needed to move to a different model uh, when we moved to education onto the, uh, out of the property tax and onto the, the, the balance sheet of the province of Ontario. I think there's accountability to taxpayers. That happens at Queen's Park. Uh, there's the administration of the system. That happens inside of the ministry and, and, and should go out to districts. Uh, but the representation of parents and the interests of parents and students, there's a very direct connection there. That needs to be done differently than it is now, uh, and I think much more locally. When you were the Minister of Education 25 years ago, did you have a plan to get rid of school boards? Uh, you know, uh, 25 years ago, unlike now, I could support everything that the government did, uh, which happens when you sit in executive council. Uh, I thought at the time that that uh, that structure had uh, had had outlasted, you know, its 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 usefulness. I I didn't think that school boards drove innovation then. I don't think they do now. Uh, I I I thought there was a better way of linking up parent councils, giving them more authority, having parents have a different window into the classroom, into the uh, what's happening with their children. That's the most intense relationship uh, inside of the system. But I thought we could administer it better, uh, more efficiently. If, for instance, we might know why it is that our maintenance costs on schools that are closed is exactly the same as our maintenance costs on schools that are open. That makes no sense to me. And so the more accountability we can have at uh, 900 Bay in the ministry, I think, the better. Okay, but did you, did you actually bring a specific plan to Premier Harris to eliminate school boards when you were the minister? That was something that we considered. Um, and the choice at that time was, uh, you know, we were doing a lot of change all at once. Uh, and the thought process at that time was, you know, we have to, we have to kind of, work within the structures of how much change we can drive at one time uh, just so the system can 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 respond properly uh, and so the school boards were reduced in number uh, you know we made changes in some trustee roles but we uh, did not at that time address the overall governance structure again i think we're 20 years late on this question hmm. Sachin, uh, can you give us some understanding of the experience in other provinces that have eliminated school boards has it worked to achieve the goals that the governments that eliminated those school boards wanted to achieve? Well, I mean, there's the stated goals, and then I think there's kind of some of the, the, the real goals. And at, in a lot of provinces where they've gotten rid of school boards, I think part of the reason that they've done that is because school boards are often viewed by the government in power sometimes as impediments to the implementation of their educational policy vision. Right. And you, you can see that, you know, even here in Ontario, a few years ago, the Ford government, when they were revising the uh, physical education, sex ed curriculum, you know, boards like Toronto basically said, we're not going to do it. Right. And so and because they're another body of elected representation, they can often be in tension with, with the government in power. And by getting rid of elected school boards, um, the province is more able to implement their policy. Now, they don't say that necessarily when they're getting rid of the school boards, like in Nova Scotia's example, 
Um, they said, we want to get rid of elected school boards to make things less bureaucratic and make schools more responsive to local uh, communities. What, what has ended up happening in that province is the school system hasn't become any less bureaucratic. They're the same numbers of layers of administration across the province. What's happened is they're just now everything's more centralized in the hands of the province. And even though the idea was that there'd be these enhanced parent councils, um, that hasn't really happened. And also it's important to note that if you put everything in the hands of local parent councils, then all the citizens in the, in each municipality that aren't parents or that don't have kids currently in the system are effectively shut out in having input to the way schools are run. And so I think these are important things we need to consider if we were thinking about doing something similar in Ontario. Laurie, get, let me get your sense of this as well, because of course you don't just represent your part of Ontario that you represent as a trustee, but you're the president of the school boards association across the whole country. So let me, let me come at it this way. The work that trustees used to do, who does that work if you eliminate the elected school board trustee? I don't know. And, and that's the risk, really. Um, what we've seen in provinces, as, as uh, Sujin says, um, you know, there is a there is a need for us to really make sure that that structure is in place. There is no evidence uh, that I have seen that um, the proposed models will achieve what they profess to uh, or that in provinces that have proceeded with that, uh, that those things have come to fruition uh, and, and replaced the ability for communities to have voice. Um, in, in Nova Scotia in particular, uh, many of the minority voices that had direct representation at the table, uh, the Mi'kmaq, Indigenous peoples and, and Black African Nova Scotians, those designated roles in decision making and policy setting are gone. Uh, similarly in Quebec, uh, where um, a minor majority language holder, um, parents and, and uh, trustees and citizens who had that structure, uh, the, the English minority language boards that remain uh, are limited to parents as, as Sachin says. And uh, you know, that, that is, is, is really a challenge as far as um, limiting who can run. How democratic is that? It's, it's very concerning. Uh, what we would rather do is focus on those models where it works. I think there's some good examples in Ontario, uh, despite some of the comments that have been made. Uh, but I would also look to BC. Uh, there, the Minister of Education has a co-governance agreement with the school board associations to uh, document how they will collaborate uh, and, and co-govern. And uh, some outstanding work has been done uh, that doesn't diminish the role to have um, advocacy uh, in, a, in a strategic way and speak out on behalf of communities, but it allows for the consultation to occur uh, and, and to, you know, I, I mean, I can understand how central governments would appreciate not having uh, all of those local tables to, to need to consult with and, and to consider when they're making their decisions. Uh, but that's essentially why they've existed and why they need to continue to exist. All right, let me follow up with John Snowblad on that. If, if you were to eliminate school boards in the province of Ontario, who would do the work that trustees are now doing under that scenario? Well, look, I, I think that this is not about efficiency, it's about effectiveness. What you want is accountable, accountability when you're producing something as important as education that uses up the kind of resources that, that education uses, is, and is that important? Um, I think accountability comes when there's uh, public attention. I think that happens mostly at the provincial level. Uh, and I think there are an awful lot of things that happen in the education system that uh, you know, like outdoor maintenance, indoor maintenance, the 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 day to day functioning of a school, uh, that really don't require, uh, you know, an elected school board trustees. I don't think that there's much that happens, frankly, at the trustee level right now, uh, that's beneficial to education that couldn't happen if we reexamine the way we do parent councils and put parents closer to the decision making. Well, the theory is, though, John, that, that the trustee is an elected person that if a parent has a problem with something going on in their school, or frankly, even system-wide, they have a point person that they can call and complain to. If that trustee doesn't exist, who assumes that role? I think that, first of all, schools should be designed to be more responsive, not through a trustee system, but through uh, the local director of education and the staff there. 
you know, I don't know. As serving as an MPP, I got a lot of school questions where they weren't resolved uh, at the level of the, of the school board trustee. And I know that most MPPs will tell you they have a long case file of people who have an issue with the local school or with their child in the school system. Uh, giving giving those MPPs a way to actually make a difference would, I think, effectively speed up things. Sachin, can I get you to comment on that? I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, over the last 25 years, a great deal of the authority that school board trustees once had has been taken away and has been, frankly, uploaded to the provincial government. Uh, would we really miss their disappearance if they, in fact, disappeared? Well, when we look at what we expect of school boards, right, I mean, to your question, things like uh, taxation powers have been taken away and, and curriculum has been centralized, but we actually expect a lot more of school boards these days than we did a few decades ago. I mean, a few decades ago, school boards were primarily tasked with hiring teachers and making sure there were school buildings and textbooks. Now they're tasked with ensuring high levels of student achievement, well-being, equity and inclusion, preventing bullying, operating childcare centers, buses, you know, networks of school buses, continuing education. And all of that is something that needs to be done at the, at the local level. And so given the greater expectations that we uh, placed on our school system, I think there still is this need to sort of tailor things um, to the different communities uh, across Ontario. And Sachin, let me follow up with this. The Manitoba government currently says that uh, if they are able to get their bill through their legislature and eliminate school boards, they figure it'll save $50 million a year. Does that matter? I mean, yeah, saving, you know, making sure money is spent effectively does matter. But if we look at, again, the, the role of school board trustees here in Ontario, as Laurie mentioned, they're basically not paid anything. I mean, you know, a, a base stipend of, of $5,000. My own research has shown that trustees uh, put in about an average of over 20 hours a week in the role while most are working other full-time jobs. And so this isn't some sort of lucrative um, position that they occupy. And most of the money we spend in the education system is in the administration and, and teacher salaries and, and things like that. So just get, getting rid of the elected school board aspect of it, I don't think will save much money at all. Hmm. John Snowden, let me uh, let me ask you the political question, which is, you know, if your government, which um, I think it's fair to say was known as being a government that was prepared to break some eggs along the way, if your government didn't feel that it had the political currency to do this change, can you imagine any other government in Ontario being prepared to do this? No, I can't. Uh, I just think that it's, um, uh, although many may want to uh, and may see the logic in doing it that way, uh, there's a huge noise factor here from a small number of people, and uh, you'd have to have something that was much better right out of the box in order to get the public will. And it would take a, a, a very big campaign to get that done. I think it could happen. I mean, I think it's, but I don't think governments have the energy for it, and it's not high on their priority list. Lori, can I get you on that? Uh, well, I, I don't believe that um, there would be support for this uh, in, in our province. Uh, while, you know, there, there will be mixed opinions on any topic, um, as Sachin said, um, you know, this is, this is less than half a percent uh, of, uh, of a school board budget. So this is not a cost savings. Uh, and for communities to lose access to someone in their community who knows what's happening, who can get them answers, um, and, who, and who speaks to what they need um, is incredibly valuable. And uh, while I think there's always work for trustees to be sure that people in their community know who they are, what they do, uh, and how they serve them. Um, that, that's an ongoing piece of work uh, for sure. But uh, strengthening the role uh, at a time in society when we have so much work to do, uh, why would we not strengthen um, all of us who are willing to, to provide that community service uh, and, and make the system better? 
Well, Sachin, humor me with this hypothetical question here. I think all of us uh, well remember uh, 35 years ago the, um, the protests in the streets when uh, the Davis government announced it wanted to extend full public funding to the Catholic school system. Uh, we well remember 25 years ago when John Snowblen was making changes to the education system and there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets protesting against that. You only have to go back a couple of years. Uh, to see that some of the changes that the Doug Ford government wanted to bring in brought people out to the legislature uh, by the tens of thousands to protest against those. If any government made a move to eliminate trustees in Ontario, do you think that would bring, bring people out of their homes and protesting in the streets? In other words, is this a big enough deal that people would get off the couch and care about it? I think so. I mean, I think if it, if it was brought forward, this is something where you would see uh, local communities push back. I mean, you've seen that in, in some of the other provinces where this has been happened as well. And as I mentioned, in places like Nova Scotia, I'm uh, sorry, New Brunswick and PEI, eventually the pushback was so great that the governments kind of sort of reinstated um, school boards on some level, or at least pledged to in the, in the case of PEI. And so I, I think most people in general are relatively happy with the way their their school boards and school districts function. And so I don't think there's huge uh, will amongst large members of the public to see such a substantial reorganization, at least not anytime soon. John Snowblen, last question to you. Do you regret that you didn't get it through 25 years ago? Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, I'd argue that that most people have not a clue how school boards function. Um, or, or who their school board trustee is. I think there's lots of ways to improve it. Uh, it's just not there on the provincial priority list now and likely won't be anywhere in the, in the future. Uh, I think when we were doing all of those innovations 25 years ago, uh, we probably should have looked harder at this. I, I suspect you look, you look plenty hard at it. I suspect you couldn't get it through the guy at the top of the, uh, the food chain back then. Am I right about that? Everybody has suspicions about those sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess they will continue to linger. I want to thank Laurie French, uh, who is uh, the trustee for the Limestone District School Board representing Greater Napanee, John Snowblen, the former Minister of Education, Sachin Maharaj from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. It's good of all three of you to join us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Monday, April 26, 2021. Tomorrow, we'll focus on how this pandemic is disrupting cancer care. And we hope you'll join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you.